Hi, everyone. Can you guys hear me well? Good afternoon. Welcome, everyone, to the keynote, uh, for, to one of the keynotes for this afternoon. Uh, my name is Nikolai Tanasso from UC San Diego, uh, and I'll be introducing our speaker uh, for the keynote. It is my great pleasure uh, to introduce Dr. Sala Sukarie. Uh, uh, Dr. Sukarie is a professor uh, of robotics and intelligent systems at University of Sydney. Um, he's also the CEO of Ageris. It's a new ag tech startup uh, that focuses on agriculture and developing uh, robotic solutions for improving productivity and environmental sustainability. Uh, Dr. Sukaria is, uh, used to be the Director of Research and Innovation at the Australian Center uh, for Field Robotics from 2007 to 2018. Um, so, it, and the, the focus of the field for uh, the, the Center for Field Robotics is uh, strategic research and industry engagement in the world's largest field robotics institute. Um, so, you can imagine as, as part of this uh, position, uh, Dr. Sakarie has been involved in uh, uh, research, development, and commercialization of uh, many, many field robotic uh, systems in, in, a, in a variety of uh, applications, including logistics, commercial aviation, aerospace education, environmental monitoring, agriculture, and mining. Uh, Dr. Sokarie has uh, many, many awards. Uh, I, I will uh, read only uh, the few that are listed here, but if you actually look at his CV, there is an extensive list. Um, so so the, um, he was awarded the NSW Science and Engineering Award for Excellence in Engineering and Information and Communication Technologies in 2014, the 2017 CSIRO Eureka Prize for Leadership in Innovation and Science, and the 2019 NSW Australian of the Year nominee. Uh, Dr. Uh, Sukarie is a fellow of the Australian Academy of Technological Sciences and Engineering, and has over 500 uh, academic and industry publications in uh, robotics and intelligent systems. So it is my very great pleasure to introduce Dr. Sukarie. Uh, thank you for that introduction, and, and it's great to be in person and to see everyone again. I'm just going to put this down so we can see where we're going. So we're going to talk about farm robotics, um, a little bit on the history of, of how we got to where we are and, and where it's all going. Um, and hopefully give you a bit of a journey and also a bit of the underlying philosophy as to why we're building and why we build them in the, in, in the way that we are building them. Um, automation and uh, farming is not something that's new. This is a postcard from 1900. Uh, the Parisians were asked what does the year 2000 look like um, and amongst many other things this is one of them. Um, so it's important to understand that the concept of being able to automate what happens on farm is is, is, has been important for a long time, and there's many reasons. And just looking at this postcard, we'll find some of the drivers that will also exist throughout this presentation. Uh, one of them, I mean, look at the age of the farmer. That's always been the case. The average age of the farmer now in Western um, society is about 60 years old, um, and they're getting older. Nobody wants to work on farms, unless you're a PhD who wants to earn some money in fruit picking. Otherwise, there's no one young who wants to work on farm. It's hard, it's difficult. Um, and this is both in the male and female, and it's even worse in the developing countries as well. And when you start to look at developing countries and you have close to 500 million farmers around the world that are either feeding families or extended parts of their towns and villages, it's quite important that we understand this being a problem. So one of them is around the age of the farmer. The other one is you don't see anybody working on farm in this particular thing. It's not because automation has taken away people working on farm. It's because nobody wants to work on there. I think the other insight that we can get out of this is the farmer moving away from working on the land and understanding the technical elements, and that's something we're going to touch on this presentation as well. So how do you design technology to help the farmers go through that? So it's labour is a big issue. That's why we talk about robotics on farm. But there are many other aspects as well that come into it. Um, if you look at... I'm going to share some statistics so we can understand the concept of where robotic farming will come through. 30% of our world is land. Of that, 70% is habitable. Of that, 50% goes to agriculture. So it's quite a significant part of the environment that we are growing either food or fibre uh, in some way. But if you then look at what agriculture causes, this is quite important as well, right? So 30% of the greenhouse gases come from it. Um, as we mentioned before, 50% is land use. 
We use about 70% of the water, fresh water, is used for agriculture for growing food and fibre. Eutrophication, which is the process of minerals and chemicals going away from the soil into the rivers and out into the sea, 70% uh, of that is caused by, or almost 80%, sorry, is caused by agriculture in some form. And uh, most of the animals on this planet are because of, we want to eat them in some form. There are more chickens in this world than the sum total of birds. Um, so that kind of gives you an indication of what's happened. And so agriculture causes a lot of the issues um, that we face on this planet. And robotics is not just about labour, it's also about, and robotics today is not just about labour, but it's also about how we can improve sustainability in the environment. And that's going to be one of the messages that we come through. And it's not getting any easier. So we're almost 7 billion. I think, um, and the prediction is going to 10 billion, and you can see where the proportion of that is going to be. Um, we are, we're going to run out of food. There's going to be food security issues. There's going to be nutrition security issues as well. And nutrition security is all about how we can use technology to be able to spread out the types of crops that we grow as opposed to just commodity crops, which, which are just very low on the nutrition value. So, there are many reasons. We've got the ageing farmer, no succession, low labour availability, aspects around climate change. Climate change is also bringing new pests and diseases. There are techniques now around AI and new tools that can come along and detect these pests and diseases. Chemical resistance. Um, we're using so much chemicals. It's almost like antibiotic resistance. We're using so much chemicals out there uh, that weeds are still growing despite the chemicals. Pests are still coming despite the chemicals we use. And on top of that, we're a very um, um, picky customer. We want the best apple, the best bananas, the best whatever it might be. Um, supermarkets are driving down the cost, and all of this is putting pressure on, on what happens on farm. And so if it's all these reasons that I've just mentioned that we're looking at robotics and AI on farm. And if you're interested in the area, there's probably a few things that uh, we want to point out. And one is that it's very interdisciplinary by nature. Um, you can't just come along and build your own robot and then throw yourself out into the field. There's aspects around uh, the biophysical elements and the biochemical elements that are important. So working with other scientists, not just so that you learn and understand about what happens on farm, but also, just as importantly, that you're um, helping them because we can provide for them new data, new information, new ways of being able to grow crops. And on the practice side, you're building robotics and AI and you're going to put it on a farm, but a farm is a business. And so when you put it on farm, there are many other aspects and constraints to work through. And again, hopefully through this presentation, you'll see some of that. But farm operations, you'll be talking to a CEO who's interested in the return on investment on a $1 million robot. Now, what's the purpose of putting one million when my margins are only 2 or 3%? Just questions like that. Farm operations, so the farm manager who's worried about, will the robot work after I turn on the sprinkler? Will it work if I put my tractor out there while it's spraying? There are elements like that one needs to worry about. So while you're mostly interested in an AI or a little robotic harvester, they're going to be kicking it. And they're going to be making sure that it doesn't break in the, in the worst of times. And the agronomist or the vet scientist is usually the gatekeeper on a farm. If your technology doesn't come along and improve their knowledge in any way, they can say no. And usually the farm operator or the farm manager will listen to the agronomist and the vet scientist very closely. So it's very important that we kind of put that all into context uh, as well. So that's the history. That's why we're doing all this. And, and, and it's also some of the elements that we want to take on. So one of the first areas that we started in uh, was back in 2005. And we started to look at drones in agriculture. And 2005 kind of proved to be the point where the technology cost was dropping um, down significantly for the use of drones. Uh, one of the first projects that we had was buying an off-the-shelf J3 Cub. This is that yellow platform that you have there, you see there. Um, you couldn't buy an autopilot. You couldn't buy a GPS inertial uh, filter uh, with, uh, with hardware. You had to do everything from scratch, from the ground up, and kind of build a unit. And what we had to detect was those trees in the back. Those trees are weeds. Uh, they can grow up to about 15 metres tall, and they have roots that go down for about 10 metres, suck up all the nutrients, and they um, destroy all the pasture that's around them, so the animals don't eat anything. There's no real nutrients in there. So flying that drone around, collecting imagery information, it was black and white cameras back then predominantly, and then processing that data over one or two nights to then get a, weed, a mapping of where those weeds were. Likewise, in aquatic weeds, so that brown stuff that you see in the river there, they're aquatic weeds. They're elements that you know you, you want to get rid of because they block up the, the waterway. Um, again, an off-the-shelf helicopter, design our own autopilot, design our own computing system. This is back in 2006, 2007, and have this robot move around and then detect where the weeds were, support vector machines were the flavour of the year back then, and that's what we were using uh, quite significantly. And you can see the little spray boom arms on the side, and those spray boom arms would come along if we detected weeds would spray. And you had big issues around downwash, for example. The, the, the propeller would push a lot of airflow, and that would cause circulation of the, of the, of the herbicide. 
and all the pesticide, and so that was a problem that you had to worry about and, and deal with. If we jump, um, so we had a lot of UAV projects, jumped to about 2015 and 16, you can now buy drones off the shelf. Um, and in this particular project, we had a multi-year project using satellite high altitude drones, low altitude drones, and looking at multi-spatial resolution data fusion to detect pests and diseases uh, in, in an environment. Nowadays, you'll get a lot of companies that are flying drones, um, or building drones actually, and, and serving them to consultants who will then use them on farm. And so you, and I'm sure in some of your research areas, you'll, you'll actually use drones as, 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 as part of this process. And the reason why I'm mentioning that is because the, the story that we're going to see next around ground robotics is what it was at the beginning of drones. We're now starting to ground robotics using ground robotics, and you can, but the technology is speeding up a lot, a lot quicker. In about five years' time, prediction that you're going to get the same process that you have here. Lots of companies having ground robots that can work on farms and do different operations. Um, and, and that becomes an element. But the, the thing about drones, though, is that low flight, you know, so very small flight time, so 20 minutes up to about 45 minutes, payload capacity, maybe half a kilogram. We have some drones now that have spray tanks that can spray and they can carry up to about five litres. Um, and so you have this capability of doing that, but they're still not good enough to actually do work on farm. And so a lot of the technology got shifted into ground robotics around 2010, 2011. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about the ground robotics program and, and what we did there. One of our first projects was in tree crops, fruits, bananas, fruits and, um, and nuts, for example, in particular. And the big thing there was around being able to detect individual flowers and individual fruit to determine yield estimates, and that, be, that became an important element. Uh, we had no idea back then about what to do and how to deal with it, so we took an off-the-shelf segue, and we just put a whole bunch of sensors on top. And those sensors, well, the idea was that you'd collect all this information, and from that information, you could then fuse that and, and start to build up some estimates of, of, of what was happening. So this was the unit just moving down and around. Um, the kind of thing that I wanted to just look, want you to see there is the, the movement. This is a quite a simple terrain. But in many tree crop farms, you'll have undulating terrain, you'll have mud, you'll have soil, and, and there's many things that you need to deal with in order to be able to align and fuse all that information that you might have um, on that unit. The other thing that I wanted to kind of point out there was a, a little box that you see at the back of it. It's still a, a hard problem and a problem that still needs to be solved, but something that we want to be able to do is how do you measure ground soil properties? So this is measuring things such as water content in the soil, along with properties about the tree, so when you're looking at the tree on the side. So if you can kind of fuse that information together about what happens in the ground, what happens in the tree, then you can actually start to build up some significant information and knowledge. But you get the classic pipeline, perception pipeline, collect the images, segment out the data, start to pull out the fruit segments um, and do fruit detection, and then you can start to get yield estimates and yield estimation processes. And that becomes the, the classic thing that we're seeing many, uh, in many papers, um, especially in this, in this conference. Doing things in real time becomes important. This is one of the first projects that we had where we were using a laser data unit and just trying to uh, laser, sorry, and, and, and pull out the data and, and in real time detect individual trees as the robot was moving along and segment out the ground underneath because the root structure is quite important. So being able to kind of look at the root structure, the properties of what happens in the soil along with segmenting out the individual trees is important and, and identifying individual trees. The, the thing that I wanted to point out in this particular one was that uh, in the previous example when I spoke about the apples, in this case here, we're talking about a trellis architecture. So it's a flat tree growing up on a trellis. It makes automation very much easier because the flowers and the fruit all exist on one side. You drive your robot along, you can collect the information. When you start looking at 3D architectures, you have a much more significant problem, right? You can't penetrate, like you probably use something like radar or something to penetrate through the trees. Uh, but, but generally speaking, you, all you're seeing is the volume of the outside um, uh, parts of the tree. And that's a critical element. A lot of tree crop, a lot of the tree crop industries now are starting to move away from 3D architectures into trellis 2D architectures. And that's going to, and, and the principal reason why they're doing that is because of the future of automation. They can see where the value of automation is in that. And so you're starting to see apples, avocados, um, nuts even growing on, on, these, on these 2D architectures. But if you start to build up, this is some of the latest work that we had, which was, in this case here, this is um, a mango plantation. Uh, you can, your robot was running up and down a couple of hours um, across a 20-acre lot of land, um, detect using the same visual imagery and laser imagery, building up volume estimates of the tree, and then doing an, a yield estimation of individual mangoes. And what's, clear, what's critical here is that for certain varieties, you can actually, you, there's a correlation between 
the surface density and the volume density of the fruit. So if you've got the volume of the tree and you can actually count the number of fruit that you see on the outside, you can estimate how much fruit that whole tree is carrying to about 95% accuracy uh, in these mango fruits. So it's quite important. And this is, a, this is one of those experiments where the only reason I can say it's 95% is because you had to go around doing that and then you had to harvest each individual row and you had to count each individual mangoes that were coming off each individual tree and then doing that co correlation. So it's quite an extensive exercise if you want to prove to a farmer that your, your technology is actually working. So I think in this case here it's about 65,000 mangoes uh, across this whole plantation. And the big, the, the holy grail, I guess, in, in tree crops is if you can do that yield estimation, you can detect individual fruits and you want to move into harvesting. Uh, harvesting is the highest labour cost when it comes to agriculture um, in, in tree crop industry. So some of the initial work that we looked at was the fact that fruit occludes other fruit, leaves will occlude other leaves. In this particular case here, this is a closed loop between an information and control algorithm. It's Gaussian process model along with some uh, a volume parametric model and using information um, control techniques to position the camera in a certain way where you can build up an estimate of how much fruit there is given that some fruit is occluding other fruit and some leaves are occluding fruit as well. And you want that to, to, to especially in soft fruit, where if you're going to harvest, coming in at the right angle is important. And, and so we, some lab-based work initially, so being able to come along and using soft grippers to try and uh, harvest fruits. So this is just trying to detect where the fruit is and, and harvest it. The thing that I want you to notice in this case is the action of removing the fruit. So it's grabbing it, and there's a slight twist in that process. Each type of fruit that you'll deal with in soft fruit industry will have a certain way of removing the fruit from the tree. Some will twist, some you'll have to kind of pull um, and snap at the end, others you can just kind of pull off the, the tree. And the reason why that's important is the way the stem comes off the plant is important because that point becomes a point where bacteria, can, you know, microbes can actually start to grow from there. So either leaving some of the stem or how you snap the stem off is important. And that becomes important when you're, when you're building harvesting systems as well. So it becomes an element that one needs to kind of work through and, and, and look at. Um, and so we took some of this work and we went outside. This was our first attempt at harvesting using soft grippers um, and it was in um, nectarine and plum trees, so soft skin um, and the way you actually remove the fruit is important. Not only do you want to take the fruit off in a certain way, as I mentioned before, as you pull it away, you don't want it to hit even the branches or the stem of the tree. Um, if it hits the branches or the stem of the tree, you scratch it, you can turn it from a grade A crop to a grade B crop and that's a significant loss of revenue for the farmer. So it's not only important about determining where the fruit is, how you actually remove the fruit, but when you remove it to not kind of bump it into anything as well, not to damage the outer layer of the skin um, in any form. So this was some soft grippers that we built in the lab, pneumatic grippers, um, and looking at different techniques about how you would actually grab, you know, so that kind of you'll see a front view of this uh, quite soon. Um, being able to kind of um, grab it, you'll see the, the different elements um, in terms of the, the, the novelty around the end effector as well as the pneumatic pits in there and how that will grab and, and using both a global view, so you, you know, where is the fruit, as well as a local view, so being able to grab it um, uh, as you're coming in closer. So this is a failed attempt at, at the process, again trying to look at occlusion and... Um, So if you can detect fruit, you could probably do a whole bunch of other things as well. So this is one of the first things that we did where, we, you know, the farmers weren't asking for it, but again, just being engineers, we thought we'd just try out a whole bunch of different things. So this is a, um, sorry, this is a, um, a process where we wanted to target and spray individual fruit. So that was happening about 30 times a second. You can see that just spraying individual chemicals on, onto the fruit itself. We thought that would be a, a novel thing. They told us no, it wasn't, and it's not something that they want. However, spraying foliage is important. So if you can actually detect the apple and spray the foliage, that's important because you get fruit fly and the fruit fly comes onto the foliage and then eventually starts to eat the fruit. But you don't want to spray that chemical on the fruit itself. And this is, this is you know, we all know, hopefully we know, that you know, we're running out of bees in the world and if we completely destroy all our bees then we're not going to have much food um, out there. Um, and this is one of the, the processes about using um, pollination. So being able to detect where the individual flowers are, pollen in a powder and there's some research areas around using pollen powder and the types of liquid to be able to directly spray at the individual flower. Um, and, 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 and using that to pollinate. Kind of putting these concepts together, we, we worked on a, on a ground robot in the apple industry again. So what you always see here is everything connected together, autonomous robot, a real-time AI system that's detecting individual apples and also the position of those apples, and then the spray unit doing a directed spray at those at you know, about 30 to 40 times a second uh, as it's going through. So it's, it, so it's piecing that all together and kind of uh, building that into that, into that framework which becomes important um, around uh, both detection, 
eventually harvesting, but also spraying. Being able to do directed spraying in all of agriculture is fundamentally important because you want to minimise the amount of chemicals that you're using. So that's the reason why we're doing that. But also at the same time, with the, the, the unique benefit that you have with the ground robotics is that you don't need to dilute as much. So generally speaking, the chemicals are hazardous to humans. You dilute a lot of that to reduce that, uh, which means you're carrying around 2,000, 3,000 litre tanks. On tree crop farms, you'll have big fans and big blowers. So as it's spraying, those plants blowers will kind of spray the chemicals through the, through the foliage uh, of the trees. With ground robotics, because you're doing precision, you don't need to dilute as much, so carrying a 10-litre tank is sufficient to do a large application of the area, as an example. This was another experiment where we just wanted to have a bit of fun and just see what, what, the, the, what, the, um, what the farmers thought. It was, a, it was a, a wheeled legged robot, and in this particular case, what we were interested in is going underneath the, the, the tree. And it's an important element because the, um, the, the, the part of the tree that's least considered is the trunk and the underside of the foliage, and that's where a lot of the pests and diseases start to form. The reason why is there's no light penetrating through underneath, hardly any airflow through there, and when it comes to spraying and chemicals, you don't spray as much around there. So this was just looking at different techniques around stability, the platform using the camera on there, being able to detect what happens on the tree, um, looking underneath at the foliage and, and kind of piecing that uh, all together. So that was on the, on the tree crops, and then uh, we, uh, the vegetable industry literally got jealous of the tree crop industry and said, you know, they've got a robot, we want a robot, but we'll give you more money, how much money do you want, which was, was a nice position to be in, and, and then, you know, so let's go and build a, a robot specifically for the vegetable industry. So now we sat down and thought, do we want to take a tractor and automate a tractor, or do we want to build something from scratch? This was around 2012, 2013, uh, this was happening. Oh, sorry, yeah, 2013. And, and we kind of looked at some trends that were happening at the time, and, and we're kind of taking for granted now. The battery technology was getting better. Um, solar panel technology was getting better. 3D printing was getting better. And so we kind of pieced that together and thought, well, let's build a more generic ground robot. This was a research project, but only it ran for about five years, looking at platform technology, AI, manipulation tools, and how to piece that all together uh, in different forms. So this was Ladybird. It had a, um, a, a six to eight hour battery life. The solar panels were giving us about 20% of that in return in, in, in charge in some form. The way we designed it this way because, again, having no experience in the vegetable industry, we didn't know what to expect when we went from farm to farm. So for different vegetable crops, you could kind of raise the wings in, in different ways and just kind of make it easier, but still give some sort of shadowing effect um, especially for the sensing that we wanted to look at. Uh, we also didn't know the road widths, so being able to adjust that on farm was important. Um, that became an important element in the process. And having a sensor and robotic arm that could move around and, and do manipulation both in the soil and the crop was also important. So the, the, the bot itself was a four-wheel drive, four-wheel steel bot. Um, this is quite a nice, hortico a nice vegetable farm because it's laser leveled. Um, and it's GPS, the rows are GPS, and so that, that makes life a lot easier, but we'll see later that it doesn't always exist that way and what you have to deal with it. But the sensors are underneath now looking at the plants and, and you know, we're doing things such as, you know, applying for individual uh, for plant detection. So we could get about, as I was saying before, about six to eight hours of, of battery life out that. This is the f one of the final experiments where the robot was going up and down. We were changing the nutrient qualities in individual rows as well as um, the water um, in individual rows. And then we had the researchers go behind and start to pluck out individual leaves from individual plants, take them back to the lab and assess them. And so the whole objective was if you could get hyperspectral, multispectral data that you were collecting from the robot as it was going over the rows, and then you were collecting those plant information and assessing them in the lab, could you build real-time AI algorithms that could assess the health quality of individual plants? And the answer to that is yes for some, for some parts, but not for everything. Um, and especially when it comes to pests, and pests, for example, or diseases where um, you, don't actually, you can't actually notice the pest on the top because pests usually want to protect themselves from predators, so they live underneath the leaves, right? So they sit around there. Um, and so you can't detect pests directly, but what you start to detect is changes in certain spectral bands because the plant is starting to feel unhealthy because the pests are detecting, and you can kind of detect that very early uh, in the process. So it became a game of, of detecting early detection of using hyperspectral of the plant health to determine whether there are certain pests and diseases in there. So after about five years, the, the veggie industry were really interested in this whole process, and they thought, okay, we want you to take this platform that you have, which is a TRL one to three, so at the lower end, can you make it operational now? Can you make something that works on farm? Um, so this was the next robot that we built, which was Ripper. It, now, battery life was about 12 hours. 
and the solar panels were giving us about 50% energy back. So we were um, using this as a mechanism now where the algorithms had to run in real time and had to run on an almost daily operational basis on farm. And the image on the right there just shows you all the different farms we have to go to. So this is um, half of Australia, you could probably say on the east coast, Australia's the size of the US, so it gives you a perspective of, of, the, of the different farms that we had to go to using the same crop, so just lettuce but on different farms, which meant different soil types. And just because you had different soil types, you had different architectures of the way the plants would grow. And that became an important element that you had to deal with as well. But um, one of the first things that the farmers were interested in was an endurance trial, um, just to kind of see what this tech would be. And you can imagine you, you, you're in a university lab and, and there's no one out there building, at this, at this particular point in time, building commercial small robots. This is only about 300 kilograms. You can't go much lower than that because you, need, you still need some weight to be able to drive the robot on the soil and on the mud. So it's about 300 kilograms, and we had to kind of get it up to that higher limit where we were pushing it um, in terms of both the mechanical infrastructure as well as the reliability of the software. But we, we got to that point, so this was a, a trial where we started in the morning and the robot was just going up and down, up and down, up and down, and we had to kind of camp and just to make sure this robot didn't fail as it was going through. Um, it was going out through the day, and the sun would set, and the robot would then move from just being, you know, battery and a bit of solar energy to just battery uh, operation. Um, and in the process of doing that, we were collecting data. And then at sunset and then at night, just moved into battery mode, just moving up and down the roads. About three o'clock in the morning, battery was, you know, almost gone. It went into a low power shut off mode and shut off its power and stopped in the middle of the paddock. Sun rose the next day, charged up, and the robot started to move again. So it was a demonstration of the fact that you could actually start to have this capability of a, a robot just being out there continuously where the farmer didn't have to worry about it and the robot would be moving around. And the kind of thing that we were doing was building the hardware now in real time and making that work. And, and so this is kind of the sensing and perception and control uh, pipeline that we had to work through. Um, we had various sensors on board from um, black and white, colour, hyperspectral, multispectral, all the different perception techniques that you can imagine to extract out information. Um, even weeds we had to detect down to the centimetre level. Um, that was important as a robot's moving in different lighting conditions. You can imagine it's, it's quite difficult, but you wanted to kind of pull that out in, in real time. And then on the, on the control front, um, you've got the cordon transformations that you're trying to detect where's a weed, where's a plant. And based on that information, you either want to remove the weed or spray a plant, as an example. So we had a spray system, and we also had a mechanical tool as a weeding system. The mechanical tool for weeding was to get rid of chemicals. We didn't want to use any chemicals in that, in that process. But you can only do that when the weeds are very small. So you had to detect. So you can imagine now you've got a robot moving around, in this case, about 6 to 10 kilometres per hour. I can't convert that to miles, so sorry, 6 to 10 kilometres an hour, down to about centimetre accuracy uh, weeds amongst terrain which is slightly undulating and then you want to be able to detect the individual plant and the weed and do something about that. But you have other problems as well. Uh, you, you, want to, you need to build a rigid platform uh, to work. It can't be too rigid because you want some sort of compliance. You want to maintain four wheels on the ground at least um, as you're going through that. So looking at the flexibility and the, and the flexure of this platform is important because if you start mounting sensors and control units um, on the platform and you've got this bot that's flexing and moving as you're trying to move along the terrain and you want to detect a weed that's down to one centimetre and remove it, then you've got to kind of factor all these processes into, into it. And you've still got to make it low cost, right, because the farmer's not going to have an expensive bottom platform. So that was one thing. The other thing that you've also got to worry about is the fact that you've got, um, you know, this flat farm. Wind can come from any direction. The wind will flow in underneath the robot, cause turbulence vortices and so forth. And if you're trying to spray chemicals, there are certain regulations about when you're allowed to spray chemicals under certain wind conditions. And you have very different wind conditions or different, different airflow conditions underneath the, the platform. So you've got to factor that into that process as well if you're going to start to spray and do autonomous spraying in, in some form. But that, they're the things that you piece together. And then what we ended up with was a, basically a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week digital agronomist, uh, something that could work in various horticulture farms, vegetable farms. Um, do real-time detection of individual, in this case here, individual lettuce and individual plants. Uh, volume estimation as well in real-time, so getting some sort of yield estimate out of that process. So being able to sit down and say, this plant we predict will have this type of yield, etc. cetera, uh, as you're going through. Um, the fact that you can detect the weeds and the plants now meant you can detect, get rid of the weeds. So this is a little mechanical scratcher. Um, and the whole idea is when the weed's small, all you need to do is kind of scratch the top of it, expose some of the root. Sunlight will be enough to kill that weed and you don't need to use any chemicals in that space. You don't want to, you obviously, you don't want to make salad out of the process. So you want to kind of avoid the, 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 the lettuce as you're going through this. 
And then also directed spraying, so being able to detect individual plants, estimates of those individual plants, and being able to directly spray at that plant. And this, this could be a fungicide, could be a, a, a pesticide um, of some form. And also we had a water conductivity sensor, which was then measuring the water, the amount of water at that particular soil location. And so what you had now was this robot that could move around. It was doing real-time AI on the plants, on the weeds. It was measuring water content. It was removing weeds when it saw it, and it was starting to build up this crop intel database uh, for the farmer. And, and that really was kind of transforming the industry. That was kind of moving into a direction that was, um, uh, was important uh, for them. Um, just as a side note, um, they asked us about whether we could remove pests. If you, if you detect a pest on farm, um, uh, sorry, if you harvest veggies and a pest goes into that while you kind of close up the pack and set it in the supermarket and the supermarket finds or gets a complaint from a customer, the supermarket will shut down your operation in Australia. That can be up for three months. And so you could shut down your operation for three months and then and, and you have to kind of then prove back to the supermarket that you're, you're, um, uh, you're back in operation. So they asked us whether we could look at removing pests. Um, in their particular case, it was frogs that they were interested in. Can, you, can we deal with frogs? Can we mince them? Can we, what, ethics department, the university wasn't going to take any of that. So we stuck with blue tape and then we just moved with that in, in, instead. Um, and, and the whole idea was, is, was quite simple. We just bought an off-the-shelf Ryobi vacuum cleaner from the hardware store um, using the same perception techniques. Can you come along and just kind of suck up uh, the pest and all the disease, in this case here, yeah, the, the blue tape. So that was, that's enough. In, in many cases, if, if we did detect the frog, there was, there was aspects such as, you know, being able to put a little flag in the ground and, and, and kind of have, um, uh, have someone else remove it. Uh, the kind of bit of the future work that we're looking at is around real-time detection of, of minerals in the, in the ground. So in this particular case, nitrogen, uh, phosphorus and potassium. Um, at the moment now, on a veggie farm, you'll take some soil samples randomly around the farm, you then send it to a lab, one or two weeks later you'll get the results back and that will dictate what you need to do about fertiliser. By then, two weeks later, your crops have already grown quite significantly. So some of the work that we're doing now is how you do that in real time. So it's not just the actuator mechanism for sampling the soil, but it's also can you build a real time lab on the robot as it's moving through so you can kind of get those measurements in real time. This is some work that we did where the crops are now much taller, um, so we're doing cereal crops here, and you want to navigate, you want to actually kind of remove the weeds between them. So in this particular case, it's a little box that sits underneath. That box can detect uh, the weeds that are in between the rows. It's, it, um, it's like a little part, it just parts the plants as the robot's going through. Um, and, and you'll see down the bottom here, uh, it's a little grinder, so when it detects a weed, the grinder will come down, so I'll just run that again. I oh, know it'll go half speed now. Yeah. Um, so as, 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 as it detects a weed, the, the grinder will come down and just grind the top of the weed. And, and that's okay for some weeds, and not all weeds. You can, some weeds, if you break off a leaf and you throw it into the soil, another weed will generate out of that. So you can't just grind any weed that you decide to see. And kind of, uh, uh, so we thought, what about nuking it? And we used laser as a, as a mechanism for some of these weeds. And it's, qu it's quite interesting because it's you know you can adjust the the, the, the strength of the laser and you can kind of burn it, but that's not what you want to do. You don't actually want to burn the weed. What you're interested in is finding the right frequency that boils the water the, and the, it boils the cells basically inside the plant. And if you can boil and blow up the cells inside the plant, then you can have a proper weed destruction process. So, and an example of that is on the far right where we got the frequency right for ryegrass. So the, in the treated one, we, we hit the ryegrass, we killed it, that was fine. You can see the control. In the turnip weed, not getting the frequency right um, meant that we killed the, weed, killed the weed, but not the, sorry, we didn't kill the weed, we kind of damaged it and you can see that it's regrown as well. And some plants where you, where you, where you shoot the laser will depend on, on the quality of that destruction as well. So for example, the turnip weed, shooting it right at the centre is the most important element. Again, you're moving at a certain speed, you have undulation, getting that target um, is important. Uh, we were fortunate being able to take that technology and then commercialising it, so taking it out into the into the real world, um, and um, and and really kind of seeing what happens with that tech when it actually hits the ground with the with the farmer. Um, these robots you can see are not as pretty as the yellow ones, um, and there's a reason for it because you want something cheap and nasty now. Um, you've got to reduce the cost of the platform uh, for the farmers, and they've got to take a lot more punishment. Um, they, and they were used daily. We had 14 of those robots around the country, moving up and down on every every day, uh, doing um, some cool stuff. So, for example, we had um, on, when you're dealing with farm operations, you're not just dealing with one robot; you're dealing with a small a swarm of robots moving around. So, being able to have multiple robots go out onto farm, um, and move to different parts of the paddock 
collecting information um, and um, um, being able to do weeding as well are some critical elements uh, that we worked on. I'll just jump through some of the elements so we can... Uh, one, one of the things about horticulture farms is using GPS to be able to move around the roadways um, on the farm, but when you come to the roads themselves, you can't use GPS because a lot of these horticulture farms, more, especially four months, will, the, the, the kind of roads meander around a little bit. So using a sensor out the front and detecting the bench, uh, sorry, the, the, um, the actual road bed um, was, was important and using that as a mechanism for row following. Um, you'll see um, in the next part of this video uh, the process of weeding. So now, I don't know if you young enough or old enough to remember Edward Scissorhands, but you know, being able to have a little chipper that can come along and take away the top of the, of the weeds um, as it was going through. And you can see what it's, what it's doing now. And, and it's, it's, in criti it's in critical that, uh, that we actually do it that way. So the, the removing, removing the top of the weed, if I can get that right, yep, removing the top of the weed is important because you want to minimise soil disturbance because if they've, already, they've already put up the bed, they fixed that up, they put in their fertiliser and their chemicals. If you start disturbing too much of the soil, you start to get these seed banks. These weeds actually have seeds still left in the soil. If you disturb the top of the soil too much, you'll get weeds generating out of that. So being able to just hit the top of the weed, especially when it's small, is important. When it gets too big, you can't do it anymore. You've got to do some other techniques, and that, that's an element that we had to work on. So, moving, so remember, this robot's meant to be out there all the time doing crop and tell. It notices a weed just coming up, and it'll, it'll come along and then remove that top of that weed. And then we could start building some dashboards, and those dashboards were quite important for the farmer, actually more important to the farmer than, um, uh, than the weeding itself. So what would happen is as we were building up this AI system that was detecting individual plants, we were noticing anomalies. So for example, some plants weren't growing as quickly as other plants. A farmer could actually click on that plant and see the life history of that plant, how big was it last week, the week before, et cetera, um, and start to build up that knowledge base. And that crop until is, is very important. Um, in fact, if you, can, if you can improve yield by reducing variability by one or 2%, none of the labor costs matter anymore. So yield and increasing that, um, that quality is much better than, um, uh, than reducing labor cost. The other element is, you can see this is the crop growth week on week um, for different rows of plants. And you get this classic sigmoidal function, which if you open up chapter three of your lettuce book, if you've got one at home, you'll see that the way it grows is, is kind of like a, like a sigmoid function. Seeing this for the first time, this, you've got to remember some, a lot of the ag scientists don't get this type of information. They're out on farm for a few hours on a day. And if you look at read papers and publications, Monday to Friday only. So for the first time, we're collecting data of plants over maybe 10 hours every day, you know, seven days a week. So there's a lot of information coming through. Being able to show that the data represents the same as the model is, is really good. And some of the work that we're looking at now is how you how do you bring in the model, so the parametric model, along with some sort of GP, GP process to learn the variables within there to get crop yield estimation. So if I'm at week, if I've learned that this variety of lettuce grows in this pattern, then in week six, can I predict what the vegetable is going to look like in week eight, nine, ten, and in terms of harvesting as well? A lot of the uh, a lot of the stuff that I've just mentioned so far has been on the large um, large properties. We were fortunate enough to kind of have an experience about building smaller robots for smaller farms, not just in Australia but around the world. So looking at developing countries as, as a key element. And you might ask, well, you know, how does robots work on in, you know in a developing economy? And and they have the same problems that we have. Um, in, in, say, in, in America or in the US, uh, sorry, in the US or Europe or in Australia. Um, nobody wants to work on farm, the kids have moved into the city, the farmers are getting older, they're getting chemical resistance, et cetera. So the whole idea was can we use some of this technology in some form to work on, on, um, on smaller farms. So this is one of the first bots that we built, it was a die wheel, it's, it's like an inverted pendulum, all the smarts are in the wheel, all the power's in the wheel, and, and what it was doing was that it's something that you could just kind of configure together uh, very quickly, within the space of about 15 minutes, put it into the back of a vehicle, take it to a farm, do some crop and tell, pack it up, go to the next farm, which is right next to you as well. So being able to kind of piece all that together on a, on a much smaller platform was, was, was key. And we were fortunate to, the, our first experiment was to actually go to Indonesia, to a place called Bandung, which is, which is kind of very, um, uh, which is one of the horticulture heartlands of Indonesia. So being able to go onto these very small, so we're talking maybe um, half, less than half an acre of, of land, um, and being able to configure these um, uh, on that. And, and more importantly, you'll see right here, if I stop, there's a selfie stick with a phone on it. Uh, what you wanted to do was go away from using really expensive technology and you, you wanted to kind of use off-the-shelf technology as much as you could. And you can find a phone anywhere. 
So the cameras on our phones are really good. The processing capability is really good. Uh, putting it on a selfie stick so that you can actually maintain a, a vertical direction as it's going through works well, and, and you can start to build up some information for the farmer. And one of the critical things is not about labour, but it's about um, crop intel, because farmers in developing countries generally will grow so much food that they expect 50% of that food to die away because of pests and diseases. And so you want to minimise how much wastage there is in that process, and being able to support them through understanding pests and disease and what to spray is, is critical. We then had an opportunity to go to both Fiji and Samoa, um, really nice places if you like beaches and whatever, but we, we did there some serious work um, in terms of access. So this is a, a simpler form of the digital farmhand, um, and being able to kind of go up and down the roads and doing exactly the same things that we mentioned before, being able to do crop and tell um, on those properties is, is key. And the, and the final thing around that space was around um, STEM activity. So it was really good that we were at Sydney and we were building these robots, but you have farms that are 1,000 kilometres away. You do, the farmer's not going to call you and say, what's going on with the AI system? It's not working. Can you come and fix it? Um, and so building up community around the farmers um, was important. We got this program where you had to build these robots and work with kids at school. And by the time they were in year 9, year 10, um, they were learning machine learning techniques, GPS, waypoint following on the robots, programming the robots, doing 3D printing, building tools for the bots. And that's really about building that grassroots uh, in there. So my final industry to work on, I'll talk to you about, sorry, is on grazing livestock. Um, and it's a much harder problem. We're dealing with the same things as before, soil, pasture, but now we have animals, and, and that becomes a critical element in there. And um, one, of the, one of the most important things about where robots might help and AI might help in this context is around the health of the animal. And there are certain grades about looking at animals. And what a farmer is really looking for is making sure that they can get the highest condition score for their animals because that marks a representation of health. And they're trying to watch out what happens when the condition score of the animal starts to drop. And there are certain things that a farmer will look at. They'll look at certain features around the rib cages, around the, 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 the top of the hind area here, around the buttock area. And they'll kind of look at all that and it's trying to make an assessment of how healthy the animal is. And the other condition is, is looking at it and seeing the relationship between fat and, and, um, and muscle. And that becomes an important uh, element. And so we had some, the, our initial work was about taking these animals, passing them through a crusher. Um, using sensing techniques and AI techniques, the animal would go at the end of the crusher, so walk along here, it will get measured, and then at the end it will, it will have a, a weigh scale and it will it, you know, get weighed. And we're trying to use AI techniques to look at, can we build up an image of the, of the animal, look at these special features that will happen on an animal and infer what the weight of the animal would be because that measures that becomes part of that condition score. Once we had those models, we could start to apply them on both satellite and, and drone data. So being able to kind of measure how they were moving, whether they were constantly moving and how healthy they were while they were moving, and also um, and using that with the, with the drone systems as well. And one of the other things that farmers were interested in is while you can measure the cattle using drones in this particular case and, and kind of classify where those individual animals are, can you measure the herding patterns that would happen? So they would send their dogs out, and obviously, as you've, you've, watched, you've seen before, the dogs will come in and start to herd the animals in a particular area. So measuring that relationship becomes important, and the reason why they wanted it is because they wanted us to build a ground robot that would do herding. So we, we attempted that. So this is one of our first robots called Swagbot, and it's much harder terrain that you need to deal with, so it's almost like a, you know, you've got to deal with undulating terrain, all-wheel drive, all-wheel steer again. And we thought, okay, let's do the same thing that a farmer does, um, let's, let's kind of take the platform, move it close to where the animals are and try and move the animals into a, um, into a, into a certain direction. Um, and it was a, a complete fail. The animals would just, you know, as, as, a, as, a, as the robot gets closer to it, they, it's, it, it was worse than dogs. They would just run anywhere and everywhere and just go all over the place. And uh, so it wasn't going to work. But something we did notice was that as, as the... Um, as the, robot was, uh, as, as, the, as the robot spent more and more time with the animals and the farmer, because the animals were trusting the farmer, they, they were used to the farmer. So as they were trusting the, uh, the robot, they started, sorry, as they was, the robot was spending more time with the farmer, the animals were starting to trust the robot because they kind of set up this relationship between that and the farmer. One of the things that this farmer does is, and every farmer has a slightly different approach, but this particular farmer would scream out, come on, come on, you know, just scream it out, and, these, and when he's got the, the you know, hay bale in front of him, he'd scream out that name and throwing this hail, and these, and these cows would just come from anywhere and just come along to eat the hail. So we thought, well, let's give that a go. You'll see uh, at the back here some speakers, and we recorded the farmer's voice. If I can, turn. Can, react to Rod's can you hear that? Coming from a robot. Can his voice alone muster the herd? 
So they're getting crews, they're used to it. They're looking at both the... <laughs> it's time for the call out. Okay. Do you want to try, Dave? Come on. Come on. Keep calling. Um, one of the one of the uh, the elements that you'll um, what, one of the elements that you find is it's a very matriarchal structure in, in amongst the herd. So if you can identify the one or two lead females, and they move, then everyone else will move with them as well. And that was one of the critical things. But then, so we thought, okay, so they're used to it now. We've got this call out. Let's do the same thing the farmer does. Uh, put a trailer on the back, have the hail bale, start calling out and see where the animals come. And instead of pushing the animals now, we acted like a Pied Piper and we were just dragging the animals along wherever we decided to go. And that, that's important because what you're looking at is pasture quality and pasture mass and then being able to kind of um, uh, bring the animals with you to where the best pasture is um, in any location. And, and while you're doing that, you can, you've got the laser unit on board laser on unit on board can start to measure individual animals. You can identify individual animals and you can start to measure the walking function of those animals. And if the walking function changes or if an animal's sitting for too long, you can start to measure or you can start to understand the, the health properties of that. The cattle industry has a big problem with weeds as well. So this is, again, the same process as before, real-time weed detection, detecting serrated tussie. This is a classic approach where we've got the, the spray unit and a little spray arm underneath, and I was doing visual surveying, so I was kind of positioning the robot to go above the plant, and then you come along and you, and you spray. And um, it was at around this time also that the farmer was telling us something interesting about the nutrition of plants. So, so when you get these weeds coming through, then the plants don't grow, the, the, the pasture doesn't grow, and if the pasture doesn't grow, then the, plant, then the animals don't have anything to eat. Um, and he was saying that, so what they do is they get these blocks of nutrients that they have to, you know, they put them on the farm and the, the animals will come along and lick it. Um, but to make the animals, to, to entice the animals to come along and lick it, because it's disgusting, supposedly, they'll add sugar and molasses into that. So there'll be these sugar blocks and the animals will come along like the sugar and they'll, they'll come along and they'll lick it. So we thought, well, what would happen then if we did the same thing? So we, we took some liquid molasses and we sprayed it on weeds and we thought, well, if the animals go and then trample over the weeds, then maybe we're going to get two birds with one stone, right? So we can actually kind of spray it, they'll move along and they'll trample it. So that's what we did. We, um, we, we kind of put this into a little yeah, yeah. tank and then uh, as the robot would move along and detect a weed, it would spray um, the weed um, and then we just sit back and wait and, and, and the cows can smell this from hundreds of metres away, right? So they can smell the sugary things from hundreds. And so they'll come along and what they did was they would um, trample along. So if I jump forward, they'll come along and they'll start trampling all over the weed uh, and eating some of that molasses and getting rid of the weeds for us. Um, at the same time. So we had this dual effect of getting rid of the weeds and kind of giving the nutrients and, and moving on from there. Okay, so I'm just going to end now with some of the, the next steps that we've got. Um, the big thing at the moment now with, uh, with agriculture is building up a digital twin. Um, it's all about how can you start to have these sensors on board, sensors in the ground, whether they're on animals, etc., and start to build up this process of, of that digital twin. And there's some key areas here that are important. Um, uh, you have this real asset which is important for the farmer, they're trying to maintain it. Um, and there are certain things that are happening in this particular space, uh, biophysical models, biochemical models, how they interact. The information flow goes up through there and you're building this digital twin between your robot, for example, and the farmer so that collectively there's some sort of action that happens on that asset. So there's some key research areas that I think are important going forward. Coupling machine learning and biomodels I think is a, is a critical area. Um, in co-learning between human and machine, we've been hearing a few of that um, in the plenary talks. Edge compute and what that happens under limited com com comms. So if you're interested in decentralised data fusion, decentralised control, edge computing, I think that's an important area. And then more importantly, you're, you're trying to deal with everything from a centimetre level to a paddock and a farm level. So having multi-resolution spatio-temporal modelling is, is, is one of the key areas. And then on the control front, um, uh, how do you do things in real time, given limited compute? I think one of the big things is still harvesting, and it doesn't need to be full harvesting, so I've called it here harvesting aids. We were doing some work with broccoli, for example, where broccoli has to be a certain heart size before it's harvested. Just being able to spray some food dye on the right broccoli that's ready to be harvested is enough for the farmer to say, well, instead of sending 50 people out there to harvest, and they're not going to harvest everything, but just I'll send out 10 and I'll just harvest the ones that have food dye on them. 
makes harvesting cost, drops harvesting costs significantly. So just having harvesting, say, um, I think is important. And one of the other things that I still think is a, a key area is around building novel platforms. There's still so much to do around that, around that space. Um, if you're interested, uh, the group has now got um, a, a major fund uh, coming through which is looking at this digital twin asset relationship, not just in agriculture but in mining. Um, there's, we're, we're interested in international collaboration as well as postdocs, so you know, please you know, reach out and, and, and contact us. So my last slide, I just wanted to again end, but most of us are engineers, computer scientists in, in some form here, uh, but none of this would have happened without a, a large group of um, both ag scientists as well as in chemistry and physics as well. Um, and that's, uh, it's, it's important to kind of have that relationship as we go through, so I'd like to thank all of them for this process. That's it, thank you. We have uh, time for some questions. Uh, we have a few questions online already, but I'll first uh, start with questions in the room. Uh, there is, I think, only one microphone here, so, so please come up if you want to ask a question. And yes, please go ahead. Hello there, I'm Talwek Chakala. Um, I had a question about any debris in your farm fields. Is it often sorry, that- Sorry, I can't, I can't hear you that well, sorry. Oh, do, do you see any debris in farm fields? Like, do you see twigs or like pods or perhaps plastic bags? And how do your rowers handle those debris? And, oh, can you not hear me? I'm sorry, just a bit more clear. I can't, I can't hear. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I don't know whether the speaker's up. Can you, can you Do you see any debris on the farm fields? Debris? Yeah, like twigs or, I don't know, perhaps plastic bags that yep. float around okay. from there. Yeah. Uh, how does your vehicle handle such debris? Yeah. And how do your vision systems handle any debris? Yep. Okay. Um, yeah. So there's so one of the things I mentioned there before was like that little vacuum cleaner, which was which was there not just for pests but anything that you you know plastic or whatever it might be that you detect. Um, so our approach is that you're applying an object detector, so it's detecting anything out there, and then the classifier will detect specifically the plant and the weed, and unknown. So the third class is unknown. And if that third class is unknown, then it's a question, you, all you need to do is flag that to the farmer, and that's a question then of whether the farmer thinks it needs to be removed. Um, sometimes, one of, the, one of the things that we do is you, 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 the robot goes in front of a harvesting machine, so it's doing the detection, and if, the har and if it detects something, the harvesting machine will stop, the person will come out, remove that object, and then it will go from there. Thank you, appreciate the answer. Okay. Uh, so thank you, it was a very informative talk. So I, I'm from New York City, so I don't know anything about farming. Um, but I was kind of just curious, because you mentioned deploying your system in like across Australia and also like Indonesia and these different countries. So like I, I presume the soil type, the climate, the crops are all different. So like when you're deploying your, your robot in these new regions, do you need like local data to train on, or is, are you able to kind of just generalize? Yeah, no, it's a good question. In fact, what happens, so um, uh, if you're, we, once you've trained a model, so let's say on lettuce as an example, broccoli, cauliflower, once you've trained the model and using classic ML techniques, lots of images, go through the training set, et cetera, what we find is that going to a new farm, even in a new soil type, we probably just need maybe 5 to 10% extra data to retrain the model on that process. So generally the varieties are consistent enough that you don't need to go through a complete machine learning process. Uh, but um, like, you, with, sorry? like with different crops, you need to like retrain. Yes, yeah, so, yeah, okay. so if you're then going from, say, lettuce to cauliflower, um, during those initial weeks, so weeks one to six, seven, they kind of look the same, and again, the machine learning algorithm is fine. When they go to that next, you know, later stage weeks where they start to differentiate, you've got to build up a new models, and we were building up models for every week. So what does a week one lettuce model look like? Two, three, four, that's, you know, so that's the process that we're going through. Same thing with broccoli. And then if you go to something like asparagus or kale, yeah, you start all over again in there. Um, and then going to somewhere like Indonesia, Fiji, we found that the models would work quite easily. There, was a, there wasn't much for the same variety. All right, thank you. Okay. Um, hello, can you hear me well? Yeah. Okay, perfect. So yeah, thank you for the talk. I really enjoyed all the videos, especially the cows, very cute. Yeah. Um, so I just see that I think we are at like a crossroads in the way we do farming today, especially with uh, you know incorporating robotics into it, right? And a lot of farming today is kind of you remove hectares of land, of biodiverse land, and you just plant one crop in there. Yeah. And you're just like 
killing the biodiversity and going back to some of the thought processes of permaculture and actually having multiple crops in the same field, it makes them stronger, right? The more immune to diseases. So how can we, you know, and from a lot of the videos, we are still going towards developing robotics for these single crop farms. So how can we go towards a world where you know, there can be multiple crops planted in the same orchard or crops planted at multiple levels of forests? You know, even there's biodiversity in the height of the forests. Yeah. So I'm just curious, what are the challenges towards um, this yeah, kind of a future? Yeah, so, so commoditization, so having a single type of crop, it makes robotics a lot easier to implement, which is why a lot of the big tractors, grain, cereals, soy, corn, you can automate them quite easily. Flatland, open sky, GPS, same type of crop, off you go. Um, what we're finding is that as you start to bring the crop and tell and the ability to do precision ag on the smaller robots, the farmers are asking those questions, which is, I want to grow a new variety of crop now in this part of the paddock because I, you know, something I didn't grow before, but I can grow now because of the fact that I've got this type of tech in there. So the hope is that with the smaller tech, you can actually start to get a bit more of that decommoditization. Perfect, thank you. Yeah. Oh, hi, so um, thank you very much for the very interesting talk. I'm um, really enjoy the robot you make in Indonesia, I think. And uh, I just have a question is, because you are using the normal, normal smartphone for that robot, do you have to take any measure to protect the smartphone? Like, because the, the smartphone is designed for using indoor mostly, so probably the using outside might be very not very yeah, good for yeah. that. I showed you there on a selfie stick, but you know, building a cover and a casing, environmental cover and casing for the smartphone. I think what's key is not so much that you're just using the smartphone, but the fact that off-the-shelf tech, um, which you can then robustify, you know, putting environmental housing around it is fine. Okay, thank you so yeah. much. And, and also I should point out that you've, you know, like if you're using some of the open source smartphones with the open source AI techniques which are out there, it also facilitates that whole process. So I noticed that you were doing some mechanical weeding to uh, disturb the soil, presumably while the weed seedlings are in the white thread stage um, to get rid of their root systems. And uh, most farms are really large. And uh, also the weed seed bank is unique. Um, in the soil of each field. Um, and no matter how cheap you make the robots, they're still expensive. So I was wondering if you did any sort of proactive uh, prediction about how the weeds will grow and how the seed bank is distributed to sort of do some multi-agent scheduling and coordination to prioritize certain rows with dense weed seedlings. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question, and, and the answer is yes, you can, you, so once we started to have these robots over, a large, over the whole production season multiple times, you start to see some historical effects, such as certain parts of the paddock will have the beginning of the weed onset coming through uh, before they spread out to the rest of the paddock, so being able to target them early is, is important. So you see that kind of phenomenon coming through, and mechanical weeding is good, but if you're trying to move it, if you get, start to get high density weeds, you, you can only remove so much of them, but you're constantly monitoring that anyway, so you've got the AI system that's detecting individual weeds, so rescheduling where it comes back to remove the rest of the weeds is also part of that optimization algorithm that sits on it. But you've got to balance that out with the crop intel decide, um, side of the, the, the equation as well, so where they want to get information is also important. Thank you. Oh, thanks for a great talk. Um, I just wanted to ask how much of a challenge is localization of, of the robots themselves, maybe especially as they get kind of you know smaller and lower cost sensors and things like that? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, uh, fun, really important, and I th and you've got to separate the so you've got to separate the nav system on different levels. So you've got the the um, the world nav system, so the GPS moving around the farm. You've got then the row following nav system, and when you've gone over rows repeatedly, you can start to use feature-based elements in that as well. And then you've got the, the localization system between the robot and the plant. So you, you've got these three tiers running in together. We're not sitting there going, the absolute coordinate frame of this weed is whatever. Um, all that's important is on that relative. As the bot gets smaller, um, for the engineering elements, low computation, low cost, et cetera, that becomes an element of it all. But the um, there's a certain lower limit, I think, as to what the weight and size of the bot can be, be, be dealing with difficult terrains, um, even on small hort farms. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and so it becomes a lot harder to try and deal with nav 
at that at that small end, which is why for us it, about 130 kilos, 140 kilos was probably the lowest we got in terms of the, to make everything work properly, the nav and the control systems work so properly. So the main reason is that stability makes the nav easier. Exactly right, yeah. And, and if you don't have enough weight, you don't move anywhere. It just, got, you know, it, it, once they irrigate, there's enough water on the ground and you've got to have that weight element into it as well. Right. And, and it's uh, a very slippery environment, environment. So localization, you've got to use the wheel odometry along with visual flow, along with the GPS to kind of close all that loop together to get the, the nav system to work properly. Thanks a lot. Okay. I just want to ask one of the online questions, and we'll come back to, to this one. So, so there's a question from Abhishek Uttar. Uh, a lot of the videos showed crops that were more like shrubs and lettuce. So, so the question is, has your team considered wheat or sugarcane uh, crops, and what have been the challenges? Yes, yeah, so, so uh, the, the, the quick answer is no. We haven't looked at that. Um, uh, predominantly because we tried, to fa we tried to look at the hardest challenges that were out there. So with those... They have different problems, that's true, but with the, the, um, the veggies and the fruits, there's significant challenges, which makes it a lot harder and a lot more interesting from a robotics perspective, so we stayed focused on that. Uh, hi, thank you hi. for the presentation. Um, I see you have been focusing on the ground vehicle, which makes sense for the application. In the last part that you mentioned about your vision about the farming uh, digitalization, do you consider to use other models, for example, like UAV, or do you see the potential use of UAV in the application, for example, like mapping and scanning, et cetera? Yeah, no, so, so uh, at the moment now we have a couple of projects which are, lo are looking both satellite, drones, and ground robots, um, and how they come together. And obviously, it's n they're not exclusive, so we're not sitting down saying ground robots are better. And when you engage more with the farmers, you start to understand the operational patterns of a farm, and you start to understand what is the right technology to use at a particular point in time. So in the cattle industry, having satellite overpasses is enough to kind of determine whether or not the animals are moving, right? Um, once every week they come along and kind of see detecting that. Um, to look at whether or not there's a health state of the animals using the drones, as an example, uh, is in that. Um, but then to move the animals around, you've got to use the, the ground robotics. In horticulture, both the drone for rapid assessment of pest diseases weeds and then using the ground robot for actual physical application. So the critical thing here is that the difference is um, even with the, even when you start to get to regulations, you've got to, you only can get a certain size drone, which only flies for a certain period of time, generally not more than an hour, um, and can only carry so much. So having something that's persistent, in our case, getting it close to that 24 hours, with a payload capacity of up to 200 kilograms, that you can actually start to move things around means that you can do physical tasks. So that, that's so you got to look at the functional requirements and kind of break it up from there. But but you you will use different types of technology for different parts of the operation. Awesome. Thank you. Great talk. Thanks. Um, so you're mentioning in your digital twin slide that you have this data that's kind of multi-resolution, spatial, and also temporal. And I was curious what representations you think about um, for combining that data and maybe even generating predictions from your higher resolution data uh, to unseen regions that only has like a lower resolution data set. Okay, yeah, so maybe I'll start with the second question. So we've done some work where we had satellite overpasses with five meter res resolution uh, hyperspectral imagery, drone with two meter resolution on, on visual RGB, and ground robots with also multispectral down to 10 centimeter resolution. And we use GPs to fuse that information together, whether we assume, and then predict what we think the spectral, uh, spectral bands would look like where the satellite was passing over regions that we didn't see. And that, that seemed to work well. Um, there's obviously more work to do that, but that's the fusion of that multi-spatial um, and also multi-temporal um, using that GP framework. Um, uh, and to kind of answer the first part of the question, generally at the moment now we've been using a lot of GPs, um, uh, and, but um, the, the area that we're pushing a little bit further into is how do we capture more of the biophysical models themselves um, and then learn the parameters of those models as opposed to just building a, a black box. And, that, and the reason why is there's 100, 100, 200 years of modelling that's gone on in agriculture. There's a lot of knowledge there and agronomists and farm managers use those models. So being able to use machine learning techniques to learn the parameters of those models as opposed to just building a black box seems to work well in terms of convincing the, the approach and the techniques that we're having. Thank you. 
Hi, I was wondering how, uh, how you map animals in a large field, uh, because animal also migrates, it's not like vegetation. Yeah, so um, the same, so when we have the robot moving around the animals, it, we're only considering the local framework. So we're only interested in how the animals are moving around that robot and if, whether we're moving them to a certain location or whether we're trying to assess health. Once the robots got used to us, and that was fine. Um, when we're interested in much larger scales, we were using satellite um, information. So the satellite data along with the machine learning techniques to, to understand how they were moving. But we weren't detecting, we weren't understanding the actual motion of the animals, but the fact that they had moved from one part of the paddock to another part of the paddock. So on the larger scales, we're using the satellite. Uh, one of the projects that we have now is a tethered drone on a ground robot. So some work that we had done before was um, beacon tracking, so having beacons on the animals, a radio tracker on the drone. You could then listen for the signals and detect where the bearing angle was basically the animals, and the ground robot would go over there and start to build up images. So you had that combination of a mid-scale resolution with the small scale. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks everyone for for staying for the Q and A session. Let, let's talk, uh, Doctor. Let's thank Doctor Sukarie for a really amazing and inspiring talk. Thank you.